All right, welcome everyone. Um, it's 11 a.m. Central, of course. Uh, so we'll uh, start the uh, Sencor ATSC3 webinar. And uh, just want to welcome you all to Sencor's virtual uh, NAB webinar series. Um, we had uh, had one last week with uh, Simpty 2110 and some training on that. Um, today we'll be covering ATSC 3.0. Uh, and uh, you can see on the, the slide there that on May 14, we've got a, an exciting new signal collection uh, product to introduce. And on May 21, some new products for our commercial AV product line. So uh, you should see uh, invitations for those coming soon. And, uh, Please sign up and join us for our upcoming webinars. So, uh, just a, a matter of introduction. My name is Seth Vermolm. I'm a senior product manager at Sencor and am heading up our ATSC 3.0 um, response and product development. Uh, joining me on the call today, I've got uh, two panelists, Aaron Doughton. Uh, one of our other product managers, and uh, and also Jason Dabbert, uh, who's kind of a hybrid product manager account representative. So, um, welcome guys, and uh, these two will be assisting me with question and answer, and uh, any other topics that come up that that they may specialize in or or be uh, helpful to chime in on. So. Uh, we'll be utilizing the, the question and answer uh, function of the, the Zoom meeting, the Zoom webinar. So uh, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A window and uh, we will try to answer them as we go. I'll probably stop a couple times along the way as we change uh, from, from one section of the presentation to another and maybe we can answer some questions along the way. So. Um, Feel free to do that, and I guess we'll get started now. So, so our agenda for today, uh, ATSC 3.0 technical information, and uh, and uh, 1.0 comparison. So the, the first thing we'll do is just kind of go over the ATSC 3.0 standard and uh, look at how it compares to, you know, the ATSC 1.0 that we've all known and loved for the last 20 plus years. Um, then we'll look at how the ATSC 3.0 rollout is going and, and some of the rules related to that. And then finally, we'll take a look at some exciting new product launches from Sencor. Uh, related to ATSC 3.0. So uh, jumping into the technical information here. I always like this uh, information here. It, this is from one of the early ATSC working groups related to what became uh, ATSC 3.0 standard. And, uh, you know, this is kind of their initial list of uh, you know, targeted uh, improvements that they wanted to make related to ATSC 3.0. And, and I, you know, it was definitely a swing for the fences standard, um, trying to incorporate all of these things. So you see, you know, lots of improvements in spectrum use, definitely ultra HD, immersive audio, you know, some of the targeted advertising and, and uh, you know, basically tried to improve everything. So, um, and with you know a, a standard that's uh, 20 years newer than the one that we um, have been using, it, it's certainly uh, understandable that um, the ATSC working group wanted to uh, cover all these things. So um, the next slide here is kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of, uh, you know, the ATSC 3.0 uh, characteristics versus the ATSC 1.0 characteristics. 
And uh, I think this gives a really good picture of, of how these two line up. And there's, there's so many differences, but um, you know, just starting with, some, with a basic overview like this is, is a good start. So from a video perspective, obviously ATSC 1.0 is MPEG-2 HD. Um, or SD, of course, but uh, ATSC 3.0, on the other hand, utilizes the HUVC compression, H.265, whatever uh, standards body you prefer there, but uh, and supports resolution up to uh, UHD, so Ultra HD, and uh, you know, vast improvements between MPEG-2 and, and HUVC in terms of efficiency and uh, a lot of other uh, things that that make it um, very useful for this new standard. Audio moves from AC3 to AC4. You know, we'll talk a little more details about what changes that brings, but more channels and and more features uh, for the uh, for the audio portion of of the transmission. Captions. Um, ATSC 1.0 had. Uh, you know, 708 captions had the 608 captions inside of them. And uh, that's all gone in ATSC 3.0. And uh, instead, it's a time text um, format. And we'll talk a little more in details about what that looks like and, and what differences that makes. Uh, service info on the ATSC 1.0 side was PSIP, Program Specific Information Protocol. On the uh, ATSC 3.0 side, uh, that is now the MPD or the Media Presentation Description. And uh, an XML based format for uh, delivering information about the services and, and uh, program guide and things like that. As far as the delivery is concerned, you know, ATSC 1.0. Uh, utilized the MPEG transport stream that came out with the MPEG-2 standard, but has been well used and well loved by a lot and a lot of people in the broadcast industry for the the past years. And uh, in ATSC 3.0, that transport stream is no longer used to package up the video and audio and, and the rest of the stream. Uh, ATSC 3.0 utilizes an IP infrastructure inside of it and for the actual packaging and delivering of the video and audio route um, or MMT are the packages that are generally uh, used for, um, for carrying and, and packaging that video and audio. So we'll get into more details on that in a few minutes here. Um, studio to transmitter. Uh, in ATSC 1.0, there was no special studio to transmitter uh, package. You, the, the transport stream that ended up being broadcast uh, was the same package that was sent between the studio and the transmitter. In ATSC 3.0, we have the, the STLTP, the studio to transmitter link transport protocol uh, is used uh, for that and we'll talk a little more in depth about why that's used and what it's for. And then finally on the RF delivery side, um, you know, ATSC 1.0 utilized 8DSB modulation uh, and in the uh, ATSC 3.0 it is an OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing uh, format of um, RF modulation. So. We'll start going through some of the details of each of these kind of from the bottom up here and uh, take a look at, first of all, RF delivery and the studio to transmitter link. So like I just said, um, you know, the ATSC 3.0 um, modulation scheme is OFDM. Um, you know, similar to what's used in, in a lot of the DVB modulations, DVB-T, DVB-T2 have been used for many years. Um, and that replaces the 8BSB eight, eight that's used in, in ATSC 1.0. Obviously there's, there's enough RF differences 
the same DMOD chips that do DVB-T2 have to be redone to support ATSC 3.0. So it's not like a fully compatible thing with, with the other OFDM um, standards that are out there. The other thing uh, related to RF delivery that ATSC 3.0 uh, has that ATSC 1.0 doesn't is um, the introduction of the physical layer pipe or the PLPs. So this really allows the broadcaster to uh, balance robustness versus payload. Um, you know, each PLP can have different modulation parameters targeting different applications. So for instance, you know, you can have a home reception um, PLP that can, uh, you know, have more carrying capacity, more, more bandwidth, more bit rate, um, but less error correction resiliency capabilities. And, or you can uh, have a, you know, a, a PLP targeted for mobile reception. So lots of, you know, for error correction, lots of robustness, but not a lot of carrying capacity. And the same ATSC 3.0, you know, six megahertz channel can have multiple PLPs targeted at multiple different services. So um, definitely a big change in terms of uh, ATSC 1.0 to 3.0. Uh, one of the other big, you know, changes that, that really comes along with uh, OFDM modulation is the concept of single frequency networks. So with, with ABSB, you had you know, one large transmitter covering a, a, a broadcast area, and uh, you know, that was the only transmitter broadcasting on that frequency in that region. Um, ATSC 3.0, because of the OFDM, has the ability to utilize uh, single frequency networks where many um, smaller transmitters can blanket a, a given coverage area. All those transmitters can be broadcasting on the same frequency at the same time uh, in order to cover that area. And uh, these transmitters are, are synchronized with, with a clock usually provided by GPS. And uh, because of the guard interval uh, inside the OFDM modulation, uh, the um, the reflections, the multipath from one transmitter to another has time to kind of ring out before the next um, set of symbols come through on a given on a given uh, carrier. So it uh, is certainly uh, an interesting strategy for uh, covering a given you know broadcast area and it it's a little bit to be determined on how, uh, how broadcasters in North America will use that, but uh, you know, certainly could play into um, how, how the transmitters set, are set up in, in big cities with lots of uh, high rises or in mountainous regions or, or even could impact you know, the translator market in, in terms of uh, being able to broadcast on the same frequency as, as the main um, signal is. So lots to be determined there. I know there's some tests starting uh, soon on, on SFN uh, related to ATSC3 and in the real world. So we'll see how that, uh, how that goes. Uh, the other thing we, we talk about on, on the RF layer and, and the, the STL is, is the studio to transmit link. So uh, there's a you know a special package called the STL TP that carries the data to be transmitted, and uh, but it also carries the timing data and, and some other synchronization data between the transmitters. So um, the uh, package that is sent between the studio and the transmitter is not exactly the same content that goes out the transmitter itself. So. Uh, there's other data packaged in it, which is why there's a, a separate uh, package for that kind of thing. So uh, interesting stuff there. Uh, one of the biggest changes on ATSC 3.0 is the transport layer. So 
So on uh, ATSC 1.0, we had the, the MPEG transport stream, the 188 byte packets that all of us um, knew and love and continue to love for the last uh, 20, 25 years that it's been around. Uh, but for various reasons, ATSC 3 has gone to an IP uh, based delivery. So the inside the RF layer is, is uh, the data is carried in, in IP. And uh, that allows various forms of, of packaging the video and audio uh, inside of that. So um, uh, one of the main ones we've seen used is, is the route dash protocol. So route is, is an IETF standard for file download. Um, and so inside this, uh, this IP layer, it, it makes it possible to carry uh, the video and audio in kind of an MPEG dash or OTT kind of format um, certainly has an advantage and it makes it easier to reuse, you know, OTT content that the same content can be used for the broadcast, the same packages can be used for the broadcast and for, uh, you know, delivering uh, the video and audio over the internet to, to, to viewers that way. So um, we've seen a lot of route dash uh, being used inside the the test markets for ATSC 3.0, and and would assume that that's one of the main uh, packages that's used. The other alternative is uh, MMT multimedia transport. So this is uh, a little bit more similar to an MPEG transport stream. Uh, it's really based on the MP4 package um, rather than than transport stream. So the ISO base media file format. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, completely different than, than the transport stream packages that are inside, uh, ATSC 1.0. So, uh, any kind of equipment that deals with 3.0 has to, um, you know, break away from that transport stream package and, and be able to manage the IP with, with either route or MMT packages for the video and audio. Um, and then as far as the um, signaling, the SI signaling, um, surface information, all of that is carried in XML-based files uh, that, that have information about uh, what services are present and, and all those kind of things. And that's, again, the uh, MPD uh, package structure that's defined in the ATSC 3.0 standard. So, Uh, as far as, you know, captions, subtitles, and accessibility, um, ATSC 3.0 has uh, shifted away from the, the 608, 708 that, that, you know, 608 has been around for decades already, long before even the digital uh, standards. Um, 708 was kind of a repackaging of that in, in the transport stream and in the ATSC 1.0. Uh, in in 3.0, we're going to a uh, time text uh, based format. So uh, this is, uh, you know, an XML file with a, a line of text and instructions for how that text is to be presented. And that's, uh, you know, with a timestamp of, of when it should be displayed on the screen. Uh, so the, you know, the standard is the SMPTE 2052-1 SMPTE time text. Uh, and it, it's got some limiting uh, a subset there as well. So this standard allows for, you know, standard text-based transmissions. Uh, so a line of text, you know, shown in a given place and at a given time on the screen. Uh, but it also supports a lot of other things that, you know, 608 and 708 captions didn't support. So uh, it supports picture-based uh, captions. Uh, similar to like the DVD subtitles uh, concept. So it's a picture of text or of special characters or whatever. It also supports all the non ASCII character sets. So non Latin languages are, are now capable of being supported uh, in, in the captions. Certainly makes it a more useful, applicable for worldwide standards, but can also make it quite a bit more difficult to translate that back to traditional captions uh, if needed. But uh, 
you know, the concept of these time text uh, really matches up with what's used for a lot of the OTT um, internet delivery packages, especially in Big Dash. So, um, and it is interesting that it um, is carried differently in, in route versus, you know, MMT, but generally the same kind of structure is, is, uh, is inside of there, so. Um, as far as the, you know, the video and audio layer, layer we touched on this a little bit, the, uh, the video used in, in ATSC 3.0 is, is HEVC or H.265 uh, video. Um, this has support for UHD, HDR, as well as, you know, all the, the standard formats. Uh, it also has support for the scalable video codec. So SVC uh, allows you to have um, like a UHD version that uh, reuses some of the, the compression data from like a 1080 version of the same video. So you don't have to send all of the data again. Um, so that's something that's being uh, played around with and, and is fully supported inside the standard um mainly targeted at UHD services. So you've got a, a 1080p base layer and a and a UHD uh scale layer on top of that. So uh reusing as much of the, the compression as possible. So um obviously we skipped over H264 in between 1.0 and 3.0. I think the, the 2.0 standard that was never really implemented anywhere, utilized H.264, but uh, uh, going to HEVC for, for the 3.0 and really adds a lot of, you know, um, bandwidth savings or efficiency, I guess you'd call it, uh, between MPEG-2 and, and HEVC. You know, I've, typically you've got uh, 40 to 50 percent improvement in efficiency between MPEG-2 and H.264, and then you've got another 40-50% improvement in, in uh, efficiency between H.264 and HEVC. So uh, quite a bit more efficient than, than MPEG-2 from 20 plus years ago. In terms of HEVC's complexity, you know, you've really got 40 times the complexity in terms of encoding, just encoders being able to utilize the the extra macro blocks, sub macro blocks, intra modes, you know, all those different compression uh, tool sets that, that it can utilize. And in terms of decoding, it's roughly three times the complexity. So, um, you know, it, the computing power is uh, certainly, uh, you know, needed in terms of being able to keep up with the encoding and decoding, uh, but but modern chipsets are are certainly able to work with those. Um, from an audio perspective, uh, the the audio is switching from AC3 to AC4. Uh, AC4 allows for lots of you know add-on features for spatial audio, uh, some other fancy features. And uh, you know, up to 12 channels plus positional sources, so uh, much, much more uh, interesting sound capabilities compared to the 5.1 of uh, AC3 that that we've been using in ATSC 1.0. So, so here you've just kind of got a look at. Um, the full protocol stack in terms of uh, ATSC 3.0. Um, and you know, there's there's many ancillary features that are, are capable inside 3.0 that, that I haven't even talked about. Um, and that, you know, really is, is part of the reason why the 3.0 standard was created the way it was with an IP based, um, you know, back into it. So, you know, there's file download, caching, web apps. Um, there's some support for 
uh, internet delivery of, of 3.0 or even, you know, some, uh, some sharing uh, interactivity between the internet and, and the over the air broadcasts. Uh, there's even a device wake up feature that I'm not sure how that's gonna work. Um, some upstream communication, potentially again through the internet. Um, watermarking, you know, all of that targeted advertising uh, and some some capabilities for scrambling as well. So um, definitely a lot of capabilities under the hood there inside ATSC 3.0 that maybe won't be used initially, but as the standard starts to be deployed, certainly can be um, can be utilized. So. All right, well, that's a, a look through the, the standard and uh, just wanna, is there any, any questions, guys, that we should cover here? Yeah, Seth, there was a kind of an interesting, um, I wouldn't say off topic, but just around the, OFD, uh, the OFDM conversation. Um, and they were wondering if like the SFN type uh, transmitter type network could actually be ported over to radio broadcasts like FM, which I'm not thinking we'll have an expert answer on that, but definitely right. I think from an opinion yeah. standpoint, I think we might be able to comment on that. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the newest version of the DAB standard does allow for some of that, I believe. So uh, certainly could be, um, could be coming for, for FM as well. I know they've, you know, we've tried to do some digital FM and things like that. Haven't seen too much uptake of it, but uh, yeah, definitely a possibility. So. Seth, I saw you uh, mentioned that the big thing here is that uh, MPEG transport streams aren't used anymore. What do you, what do you see as the challenges um, that poses when you're trying to integrate ATSC 3.0 into your current workflows. Right, and, and I think we'll, we'll get to that maybe a little bit here when we talk about retransmission uh, and, and some of the challenges there. But uh, yeah, from a, you know, a, a broadcast equipment manufacturer perspective like Sencores, you know, we've been making equipment centered around transport streams for the last 25 years. And, uh, this really breaks with that. Obviously, we've been making the transition to IP in many ways um, in in the last 10, 15 years. So it, it's not a huge break, but uh, yeah, I mean, just having to to deal with without having that that transport stream package inside there complicates retransmission a lot. And as you know, especially as it applies to MPPDs that cable systems and, and other systems that still utilize the transport stream package throughout their infrastructure. It's, it's certainly uh, a big change. So we'll all have to deal with that. All right, so let's, let's hop into some of the rollout and rules of 3.0 and uh, go from there. So, uh, you know, the official ruling that kind of kicked this all off is, is the November 16, 2017 uh, FCC report and order. So this uh, is, the, is the, the FCC ruling that, that finally allowed ATSC 3.0 to be, to be uh, transmitted in the U.S. So and just you know, a couple highlights from that report and order. So uh, no, no station is forced to convert from ATSC 1.0 to 3.0. It's, it's a voluntary optional thing. Um, if stations do elect to transmit 3.0, uh, they are required to simulcast their programming in ATSC 1.0 for, um, for five years. So uh, there's some debate about what that means in terms of you know, absolutes, but uh, the, the report and order basically says that there should be a substantially similar broadcast in 1.0 for, um, yeah, for five years and, and 
has to be substantially similar to the ATSC 3.0 um, broadcast. So certainly you're seeing a lot of concepts about lighthouses uh, where, where different broadcasters in a, in a given market uh, band together, designate one of the transmitters as an ATSC 3.0 lighthouse uh, shared and, and then kind of team up their broadcasts on the other other transmitters as 1.0 or maybe flip that around. You have a 1.0 lighthouse um, broadcasting all the, the substantially similar simulcasts and then the other transmitters are used uh, for 3.0. So a little bit to be determined how that actually plays out. Uh, seems like the lighthouse concept is uh, is the way most of the markets will go, uh, but um, that's all just optional and, and up to up to the different broadcasters and markets at this time. So uh, there doesn't seem to be any FCC plan to adopt, you know, a tuner requirement on on TV sets like they did for 1.0, and I definitely haven't heard any any uh, in indication that there's going to be. Uh, you know, a converter subsidy of any kind uh, coming from the federal government. Um, potentially that may change, but uh, at this point it's, it's pretty much being put up as an optional uh, transition for, um, for broadcasters. So. You know, and, and really this, this plays into, uh, you know, a lot with retransmission negotiations between the, the broadcasters and the, you know, the MVPDs that are looking to, uh, you know, retransmit these, these signals. Uh, two things specifically that were part of the report and order is, uh, you know, must carry rights only apply to AC, uh, ATSC 1.0 services for now. And, uh, yet broadcasters are free to negotiate for carriage of their 3.0 signals in their, in their consent negotiations. So it really leaves a lot of uh, open questions about how this will play out in terms of um, being able to uh, carry these uh, signals and, and how, how they'll be re retransmitted in, in cable systems or IPTV or, or other uh, scenarios like that. So, you know, we see a lot of different possible retransmission scenarios where, you know, you're doing some kind of ATSC 3.0 turnaround, demodding it, you know, taking the, the video and audio, transcoding it back into a transport stream that's, you know, H.264, MPEG-2 video, and then feeding that into the existing system. Certainly the for the five years, you've you've got the uh, the simulcast in 1.0, so that could be the signal that that's used in these uh, retransmissions, or you've got some kind of direct link from the station, so microwave or fiber, uh, giving uh, you know a, a copy of of a transport stream coming off the encoder, or even the raw, you know, uncompressed audio and video could be possible. So there's lots of different ways that uh, the, the, the station's uh, signal could, could still be delivered to these uh, retrans uh, MVPDs, but uh, a lot of that is yet to be determined on how those, those will, will look. So, uh, you know, in terms of, of the rollout, um, this is a, a map that was just put up on the ATSC website a couple weeks ago. So I'm talking about 62 uh, first markets that, that plan to be on air with ATSC 3.0 within a year. Uh, those are all the, the blue ones. Um, the orange ones are the ones that are uh, on air right now. They've got Orlando, Dallas, uh, Phoenix, uh, actually, I think the, the list is on the next slide here, but, um, you know, quite a bit of coverage there. And, uh, you know, that will get a good portion of uh, the country in reception area of an ATSC 3.0 signal. 
good portion of the population, you know, obviously most of these uh, are in the higher population centers. So, um, but a lot of the country within the next year should be able to receive an ATSC 3.0 signal, uh, at least one. So, uh, like I said, at least one station is now transmitting in, in 3.0 in Portland, Boise, Santa Barbara, Phoenix, Dallas, and Orlando. Um, I just saw a press release uh, today that Las Vegas is being turned up as well. So I think that was the light blue one on the, the previous slide. So lots of, uh, lots of stations starting to come online. We'll see if the, the 62 does happen in the next year. Uh, that's a lot of a lot of transition there, but uh, exciting definitely. And certainly, you know, Sencor and other vendors have been doing a lot of real world testing of of ATSC 3.0. There's my my picture from Phoenix this past uh, this past winter, where um, you know putting up an antenna and uh, using it to see see how equipment works, taking recordings, things like that for uh, testing purposes. So, uh, you know, the Phoenix um, test site has been going for almost, what, two, two and a half years now. Um, so that's uh, been a useful resource for a lot of us in the equipment industry. And uh, looking forward to that spreading to, to many other sites as well, so. All right, any, any questions, guys, that we wanna cover? Yeah, we've actually got quite a few of them, so uh, we'll get started on uh, trying to get some of these answered. So uh, the first, uh, it's kind of a two-part question, but it's really around um, the audio standards that are in ATSC 3.0. Um, one question was the ability to redistribute ATSC 3.0 in a home network via home gateway. Um, but obviously the problem with that is, is that any, you know, normal consumer televisions and stuff like that might not be able to decode AC4. So the question really kind of comes down to, will there have to be an AC4 to AC3 uh, conversion needed in the home gateway? And then also, uh, what happened to MPEG-H? Is that actually a part of uh, the candidate uh, or candidated standard as well? Sure. So... Uh... Yeah, the, the compatibility with AC4 could, could certainly be an issue on home networks, uh, home TVs. Um, we'll have to see how this plays out in terms of, of the uh, equipment manufacturers, the home gateways. I, I assume most of these are gonna have to be doing some kind of transcoding, either of the video or the audio or both uh, to make it compatible with um, with current TV infrastructure, so and yeah, MPEG-H. I believe you know there's there's quite a few that's of of audio formats that are allowed inside the standard. Uh, the question is what what is actually going to be you know the the format that's broadcast and you know over the air seems to be uh, almost exclusively AC4 at this point. So um, you know I think the standard allows for others, but there's, there's kind of the question of standard versus real world as well. So, Seth, uh, do you know how EAS has handled the ATSC 3.0? Uh, I'm not totally an expert on that. It, I'm, I believe it's an XML based, um, as, as are most of the ancillary things inside ATSC 3.0. So it'll be some kind of XML based uh, indicator of, of uh, of an emergency happening and, and how that is packaged in there. I'm not totally an expert at it, so. Um, next questions are pretty much about uh, bandwidth of OFDM. Um, so the first question was, what is the data throughput uh, using OFDM? And then potentially how many HD programs could we squeeze into one frequency? Sure, yeah, I've heard, I've heard lots of different, you know, I, I think the, the the maximum with you know the least amount of so so ATSC 1.0 and 8 VSB there was kind of a fixed you know symbol rate and, and guard interval and all that was kind of fixed so it was 19.39 megabits per second was your carrying was your band you know your your bit rate that could be stuck inside a six megahertz channel with 8 VSB with ATSC 3.0 all of those 
um, characteristics of the modulation are, are really variable. So the, the broadcaster can choose you know, what FEC code rate guard interval they want to use. And, and all of that varies then the amount of you know, air resiliency that um, the signal has versus its carrying capacity or, or bit rate. So, um, you know, I think with, with the least amount of protection and the highest bit rate, it, you know, it can go into the 30 or 40 megabits per second, but then obviously that makes for a, a signal that's not very error resilient and not able to really be, um, you know, carried and picked up in very many scenarios. So what I've really seen in most of the common, uh, you know, uh, modulation formats is, is a, a bit rate around that 25 megabits per second is kind of common in terms of, uh, you know, what, what can be uh, carried on an ATSC 3.0 RF signal. And, you know, then you add in the, uh, the HEBC compression where you can get an HD service down to, you know, two or three megabits uh, easily. You could certainly, you know, put 10 HD signals on, on one ATSC 3.0 transmission. Um, you know, usually your UHD is about four times what an HD takes, so uh, you can kind of do the math there, but, um, you know, so, so with typical, um, typical transmissions, ATSC 3.0, you, you easily could have around 10 HDs uh, packaged on there. So. All right, thanks, Seth. Um, we'll get to more of these, I think, at the end. But for the sake of time, let's run through here, and then we can get to the. We have a whole bunch of questions here, so I don't, we're not going to get to all of them. But sure, yeah, yeah. Let's let's uh, jump into looking at Suncor's ATSC 3.0 prod products. So we've we've been uh, following and and participating on some levels uh, with the ATSC 3.0 standard for for years already, and keeping an eye on when the market's going to be ready for products, when we need to be out there with different equipment and uh, have really in the last year jumped on our uh, development uh, roadmap here and really started focusing on some of these uh, ATSC 3.0 products. So uh, some of these that I'm going to talk about, this is kind of the first uh, uh, time we're announcing these publicly, but uh, we're very excited about our uh, ATSC 3.0 products and, and roadmap here. So uh, the first product I want to talk about is our uh, new SLM 1530. So um, this is uh, one of the first uh, signal level meters, handheld portable signal level meters in the world that, that supports the ATSC 3.0 standard. Uh, we we should be uh, shipping this product here within the next couple weeks. Uh, to some uh, some of our customers uh, and uh, have already tested this in a variety of markets. Uh, you probably maybe saw it laying there in my picture from Phoenix this winter, just trying to uh, test its real world capabilities. So, uh, you know, this has got all the necessary measurements, you know, you'd expect in a signal level meter. So uh, power spectrum, MER, BER, uh, and really one of the, the most interesting features is it has full on-screen color, video and audio decoding of, of ATSC 3.0 services. So, uh, you know, this, the screen's uh, only a couple inches, but you can get a very good idea that the service is working and uh, video and audio are there. And um, so for, uh, you know, as these, uh, ATSC 3.0 transmissions start rolling out across the country. Um, a, a handheld meter like this would certainly be a, a useful tool uh, so people don't have the little USB dongle that they have to plug into their computer and things like that. So um, very excited to have uh, the SLM 1530 available here in a few weeks. So look for more information and, and press releases about this to come soon. The next uh, 
product launch we have coming here uh, also in in a uh, couple weeks time hopefully here is is our new ARD 3100 and 3400 so these are our ATSC 3.0 terrestrial receiver decoders um, so this is uh, an exciting new product for us as as customers uh, need to be able to receive these ATSC 3.0 signals and decode the programming either for confidence monitoring, um, potentially decode for re-encode, so having an SDI output, being able to you know run that in and, and re-encode that. Uh, certainly a lot of experiment lab uh, applications for a product like this as well, all uh, built on the you know the Sencor IRD platforms that a lot of our customers uh, definitely know and love and use uh, a lot. So we're we're happy to have this one available very soon here. Um, and it's a one RU web based. Um, we'll have an actual ATSC 3.0 RF input outputs. Uh, you know, in SDI or uh, soon after, maybe even SMPTE 2110, and uh, can support four HD decodes in, in the same single unit uh, or one UHD decode. So uh, very exciting for us to be able to have this out here and, and available very soon. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, the other new product, a little further out for us, uh, we're working hard on this one right now and, and looking forward to releasing it this fall is, is an ATSC 3.0 transcoder. So as we talked about a lot of the um, you know, MVPD retransmission concepts and, and possible ways of doing that, uh, it's really become clear to us that a transcoder such as this is um, very necessary. Uh, to allow uh, turning the ATSC 3.0 signals back into a, a transport stream or a one oh, ATSC 1.0 like format. Um, and so that's what this product will do, receive um, ATSC 3.0 as, as an RF signal or, or even as an IP signal, being able to transcode those from HEVC back into MPEG-2 or H.264 in a transport stream uh, transcode the audio from AC4, you know, back into AC3 or, or other common formats, transcode the captions uh, from the time text file back into 608, and uh, output those as, as IP multicast or ASI streams. So um, lots of potential here for, for a product like this that for, for customers that need to carry uh, ATSC 3.0 signals but back on their existing infrastructure that's built around a transport stream and an ATSC 1.0. So uh, this is in the works right now and, and will be coming soon. So. And the final uh, product I, wa I want to talk about is uh, the DECTEC test modulator. So Sencor is the, the primary DECTEC dealer for North America and uh, are ready for a few years here in, in the DECTEC uh, modulators. There has been support for ATSC 3.0 modulation. So uh, for customers that are looking for uh, uh, the ability to um, modulate a test signal for their uh, labs or, or their tests, uh, we have uh, a variety of USB or, or uh, PCI Express cards that are able to be uh, used to create ATSC 3.0 RF signals. Um, these can modulate from, uh, you know, a PCAP capture of, of an existing, um, you know, of a, one of the ATSC 3.0 broadcasts. It, it can modulate from a live, you know, ATSC 3.0 IP signal coming off an encoder. Uh, and there's there's some powerful software that allows for uh, configuring all the settings within the um, within the RF channel. So perfect tool set for for lab use or testing of of 3.0 signals. So very good. So that that's the presentation. Um, 
I mentioned that we had quite a few questions, so we'll we'll try to answer some of them now, and the rest will we'll get back to you uh, separately after the presentation. So. All right, Seth, I got a couple here related to the SLM. Um, one, will you be able to use SLM for uh, mobile me measurements of like cable leakage and those types of things? And then secondly, can you take captures over the IP interface on the SLM? Both very good questions. Um, the, the SLM 1530 is really targeted for um, the, the ATSC 3.0 and 1.0. Uh, it does have Quam B capabilities, um, but we haven't really focused on doing all the, the uh, you know, typical cable meter kind of measurements like leakage. So um, maybe that's something we'll add in the future, but um, at this point, um, not, a, not a capability. Um, as far as the PCAP and, and IP question, that's actually a very, um, that's, that's an idea we're working on uh, as well. So being able to capture those, those PCAPs, uh, you know, the IP raw data off and on ATSC 3 RF is, is definitely uh, um, a, a great feature that we, we plan to add to that product. Uh, probably won't be there in the initial release, but uh, just wanted to get it out there uh, as early in this process as we can for a, a product that uh, can help customers as they uh, roll out their ATSC 3.0 and uh, validate those transmissions. So. All right, I think the next one is uh, partly political and partly technical. Um, so I'm sure you probably have some uh, opinion on this one, but, but do you have any thoughts on how the FCC must carry rules will be affected by ATSC 3.0? Will Cable TV providers uh, need to port all services through uh, through their edge or only the main channel? Um, and will there be any significant challenges to the complexity to carry um, through with services, especially targeted ads with IP streaming components and, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, that's, that's good. I'm, I'm not a politician, uh, so I'm not sure I'm totally qualified to answer the, the political aspects of it, but like you said, the current rules don't um, specify anything as as far as you know ATSC 3.0 and must carry, um, but but certainly that will come up in the retransmission agreements between you know stations and and cable and other MVPDs. Um, I, it's hard to say how it's it's going to end up. Um, you know, I think. Plenty of them will, will you know, retransmit the 1.0. Plenty of them will, will, will negotiate with the, the station to get a direct link of some kind. And, and many of them will need a device like the TXS3800 to transcode the, the 3.0 back. So, yeah. Seth, I see um, in your ATSC3 roadmap that a bunch of these are defined as individual products. Um, are there plans to integrate ATSC 3.0 into the existing Suncor products like Atlas Gear and DMG and VB? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, we've we've defined our our first set of um, products that we're working on toward ATSC 3.0. But uh, obviously, yes, yeah, Suncor has a a large inventory of uh, existing products, and you know, I think especially the Open Gear platform for us is very interesting for 3.0 and will likely be something along those lines in our next round of uh, ATSC 3.0 rollout. Uh, you know, the Open Gear platform gives us lots of density um, that we can utilize. So I would, I would definitely see, you know, some kind of uh, ATSC 3.0 IP, ATSC 3.0 RF to IP, you know, gateway kind of, um, conversion product uh, for open gear as being one of the, certainly one of the next things we, we start working on here. Now that the DMOD chips are starting to uh, hit the market and become more available, it makes it a lot easier to do those, those kind of things for us. So, yep. But the, the whole lack of a transport stream, you know, a lot of our 
existing products are built around transport streams. So that really uh, changes the internal mechanisms and, and makes things uh, have to be redesigned quite a bit to, to support the ATSC 3.0. So. All right, next question was, uh, how does the OFDM modulation transmission uh, qualities compare to ABSB? Um, like for example, is it use lower power? Is it less prone to errors? Things like that. Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of trade-offs between, between the two, you know, ABSB when it first came out was, uh, you know, pretty cutting edge and, and there was even a, a little bit of a, um, a rethinking it right before it was, you know, before the 1.0 standard came out to even switch it to, C to OFDM back in, you know, 1998. So it's not like OFDM is, is a brand new thing at all. And, uh, you know, multi-path is, is one of the big advantages of, of OFDM over, over 8BSB. Although really we've seen that, you know, just the processing capabilities in modern demodulators really somewhat has kept 8BSB uh, up with, with OFDM. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's OFDM has has a lot of benefits, and and really it comes down to mainly multipath, and and kind of tied in with that is the whole single single frequency network uh, capability, where you can, you know, because of the multipath resiliency of of OFDM, you can do things like single frequency networks where you have multiple transmitters um, on the same frequency at the same time. So. It depends, you know, and like I said, the, the AT, ABSB was kind of a fixed um, modulation parameter standard. There was really only one choice with with OFDM in 3.0, you have the choice, you know, to, to make your signal more robust, but then have less, um, you know, bit rate, or you can have a lot more bit rate and, and make it, um, you know, less robust, I guess you'd say, so. It varies a lot. All right, Seth, I think that about covers it from our side. Okay. Well, thank you all for, uh, for joining us today. And uh, we'll be uh, sending out links to the, uh, the presentation to all the attendees in the next day or two here. So uh, look forward to that. And so thank you all very much.